a pleasure. <laughs> It's a pleasure to welcome uh, John Reynolds from the Salk Institute here for a talk today. Um, John is an unusual neuroscientist. He started uh, the Bachelor of Science in Economics at UPenn. Then he went to Boston University where he did his PhD in the Steve Grossberg's lab. Then he became a more regular neuroscientist, I think. He went to NIH and worked with Bob Desmond there. And since 2000, he's been uh, in fact, it's uh, Salk Institute. His lab studies uh, the neural mechanisms of attention, and he uses a range of computational, pharmacological, electrophysiological, and now uh, optogenetic uh, methods to study this, in, uh, mainly in the non-human primate, some in the human primate as well. Uh, I'd love to tell you some juicy stories about John, but, but I can't, because he, I know he knows more about me than I know about him. So, um, we'll just listen to his thoughts. Sure. That's probably the best thing. <laughs> well, thank you, Mark, and I want to thank everyone for uh, for having me here today, and I guess Paula had to, oh no, Paula is here. Paula, thank you for uh, encouraging me to come out for a visit. I really enjoyed it this morning, and I'm looking forward to meeting a uh, number of you over the next couple of days. Uh, so today I'm going to uh, describe research that I've carried out over the last uh, several years at the Salk Institute looking at the neural mechanisms of visual attention. Um, and I want to begin with just the idea that is sort of an organizing idea for my research, which is that the visual system, like any information processing system, is limited in its capacity to process information and that the amount of information that's present in a normal scene is larger than we can process in a single glimpse. And so we therefore need to have mechanisms in the brain, and, and evolution has given us mechanisms to select out behaviorally relevant information from among all of the sort of welter of information that's present in a scene. Now for those of you who don't think about these issues uh, regularly, this may not seem intuitively obvious because it feels as though when we look, we just see it's a transparent process and if it weren't, it would be a disaster for us. But there are ways that we can unmask the limitations of the visual system and one of the more amusing ones is a phenomenon known as change blindness. So I'm showing you here two pictures, one, two, one, two. And if you haven't seen these two images before, it may take you a moment to see the change that's taking place. Now one of the ways we do this is we move our eye from place to place and we foveate different objects. And if you foveate the change, you'll see it. The change being this appearance and disappearance of this object on the bow. Um, to satisfy yourself though that this isn't just a matter of foveating the wrong location, if you foveate the boat down here and direct attention to the location of the gas can, you can now see it appearing and disappearing. So if we had been recording from retinal ganglion cells with receptive fields at the location of the gas can, you would have observed that they were being modulated by the appearance and disappearance of the object. So this is a change that takes place at the input to the visual system, but it's not something that enters your awareness until you direct your attention to the object. And so uh, research in my laboratory is devoted to understanding how that is done, how that is accomplished. And really this is a model system for my true interest, which is understanding the organization of the cortical circuitry that mediates this process. So I, uh, one of the exciting observations about the cortex is that all of the areas of the brain, from the primary visual cortex to the auditory cortex and to the frontal cortex that mediate perception through vision, through audition, that allow us to control and plan motor behavior, are all mediated by roughly the same cortical circuit. The same uh, players are involved. Um, and so we believe that if we can focus our understanding of that cortical circuit in a single well-defined uh, area, like one area of the brain, and observe how it operates as a function of a simple task, which in this case is attention, that gives us the beginning of understanding that the basic blueprint of the cortical circuitry. So we study this primarily in the rhesus macaque, uh, and we have chosen this as our, our animal model for a number of reasons, one of them being just the similarity between the human brain and the macaque brain. Um, we would like to be able to apply our understanding that we derive from, the, from studies of the macaque directly to human health. Um, and so for those of you who don't study vision, uh, just to remind you, light falls on the back of the retina where it activates uh, retinal ganglion cells through, through, a, through a network of cells that then transmit their signals to the lateral geniculate nucleus and then out along the optic radiations into the primary visual cortex. 
and then in both the human and in the macaque, this visual information then passes through a network of visual areas, which I've, I've drawn a few of them here for the macaque. These are the areas that make up the ventral visual processing stream, primary visual cortex, area B2, B4, TEO, and TE. Uh, which brings up a second reason that the macaque is especially useful to us, and that is that this animal has been studied for decades and is perhaps the most well-studied system in systems neuroscience. There are over three dozen visual areas that have been individually identified, and understanding the way that they're connected and what their functionality is to the extent we do helps us frame the questions that we're interested in studying within the visual system. Of particular relevance are studies, to, for, for today's talk, are studies in which area V4 has been lesioned. When area V4 is removed, this leads to a very modest impairment in basic sensory discrimination. So distinguishing whether a grading is vertical or slightly off vertical, the threshold for that discrimination is virtually unimpaired by removal of area V4. But if the same discrimination has to be made in the presence of distracting stimuli, then the monkey falls to very poor performance. His thresholds are much elevated, and they elevate monotonically with the salience of the distracting information. And so this suggests to us that, the, that area V4 is one of the areas that contributes to our ability to attend to a target and select it from among distractors. So if you were to be missing the human homologue of area V4, you would have found it difficult to, to foveate the boat and direct attention to the change. So this idea that V4 plays a role in this selection process has led us and others to lower electrodes into the brain of the macaque as it performs a task, which, we, which I'll describe in a moment, which, which requires the animal to attend to some stimuli while ignoring others. Uh, and that is a third benefit of using this animal, which is that they can be trained to perform behavioral tasks that enable us to precisely control the information that they need to process in order to, to gain reward. Um, over the course of, of numerous experiments in my laboratory and others, we have identified a sort of canonical set of ways in which neuronal signals change when attention is directed into the receptive field of a, of, a, of a neuron. And these include improvements in contrast sensitivity, scaling of neuronal firing rates, sharpening of neuronal tuning curves, suppression of distractors, so suppression of the activity of neurons that respond to task irrelevant stimuli, shifts in the profile of the receptive field, and we've recently uh, contributed a new discovery, which is that attention also reduces the degree to which neuronal responses are variable over time and thereby increase the signal-to-noise ratio of the neuronal signal. Um, so the emerging picture that, that, uh, that we have of attention is that there are a number of, is, is that area like, areas like before are not operating on their own, they are sensory processing areas that receive feedback signals from a number of different areas, including the frontal eye fields, the superior colliculus, the pulvinar, the lateral room, the parietal cortex, that together make up a network of areas that control the allocation of attention, which takes the form of these feedback signals that then impinge upon the circuitry in areas like V4 to give rise to all of these changes. And so a way of, of considering the attentional system as a whole is what are the neural mechanisms in area V4 that transform these feedback signals into these different forms of attentional modulation. So before I go into, uh, into the way that we view this and experiments that have helped us understand this, I want to begin by just being a little bit concrete here by illustrating the task or one of the tasks that we use in our laboratory to, to, to guide the allocation of attention. So we begin each trial by presentation of a fixation point at the center of a computer monitor. The monkey is sitting uh, in front of the monitor, and the monkey can initiate the trial by foveating the fixation point. So you'll see a movie in a moment where this little red cross indicates the position of the eye of the monkey. We're measuring with, a, with an infrared eye tracking system. We then present stimuli in the visual field. Here are four Gabor stimuli, or stripe patterns. And after a moment, we briefly highlight two of them, and then we return them to their original luminance condition and the task of the monkey then throughout, throughout that trial is to mentally track these two stimuli as they'll move around on the screen. And at the end of the trial, the monkey earns a reward by making a saccadic eye movement to each of the two stimuli that were originally cued. So that's how we know that the animal did, in fact, mentally track the stimuli throughout the trial. So the movie that you're seeing here is real time. This is actually trials that were performed successively by the monkey. 
you can see he foveates. This circle here is just the location of the reality field. It's not actually on the screen. And what, we, what you see is that the stimuli move, enter the receptive field, then move on, and then at the end, we remove the fixation point that the monkey then makes the cats to each of the two stimuli that were cute. So it's like a shell game on the street corner of New York. You know, he's trying to keep track of which of these were originally cute as they moved through space. And you can hear the neuronal responses from an isolated cell in area V4. And what you'll see is that um, the key period of time is this pause period. So that's when the stimulus is really under good experimental control. We've positioned it at the center of the cell's receptive field. So once again, it pauses. Then we're recording the responses in that period especially. Uh, and we can compare the responses of the neuron when the monkey successfully attended into the receptive field versus when he was directed to attend away from the receptive field. And since the sensory conditions, including the trajectories by which the stimuli entered the receptive field, are matched across attention conditions, the only explanation for any changes we see are the mental state of the animal, whether he's directing his attention into the receptive field or not. These are um, psychophysical curves showing, in a way that I could go into more detail, but at, at present, just trust me, what this shows is that, that monkeys can track two items, but they can't track three or four. So if we direct them to track two of the four items on the screen, then we can rest assured that because they report at the end of the trial which two were cued, that those two were attended and the other two were not. Humans do a little bit better. They can track three items under the same sensory conditions uh, as the monkeys. So that's, the, that's one of the purposes of the task. It's just to require the monkey to attend to some things, and by withdrawing attention from other things, we can compare attended and unattended stimuli. And this allows us then to, to do comparisons like this. So let's say we have a trial in which the monkey's been cued to attend to these two stimuli. We are now recording from a stimulus that's unattended. On other trials, by cueing different stimuli, we can cause the monkey instead to attend into the receptive field. And when we do that, we see this, uh, this sort of pattern. This is a single, well-isolated V4 neuron. And we've sorted the trials into the trials in which the monkey was attending into the receptive field and those in which he was attending away. And what you see in each row is just the time of each action potential. These two yellow lines correspond to the pause period when the stimulus is attending in the receptive field. So as the stimulus sweeps into the receptive field, it evokes a response, then it pauses, and then it drives the cell on its way out. And what you can see by zooming in on these is that there are more action potentials evoked when the monkey is attending to the stimulus than when he's attending away. And this is also shown down below where the red line shows the trial average response for trials in which the monkey was attending into the receptive field, and the blue line shows under identical sensory conditions when he was tending away. So for this cell, there was a marked increase in the firing rate of the cell when the monkey directed his attention to the stimulus in the receptive field. If we look across the population, we see this pattern. So these are, this is a, a histogram which shows an index of the attentional modulation, just the difference in firing rate across the two conditions divide, divided by their sum. So positive values correspond to cells that showed attention-dependent increases in firing rate. Negative values correspond to decreases. I've color-coded the, the cells that showed statistically significant modulation, and you can see that the majority of cells that were modulated significantly by attention showed attention-dependent increases in firing rate though there was a minority of cells that showed some highly significant reductions in the firing rate when attention is directed into the receptive field. Uh, this is one example of, of this sort of work. This has been the subject of study for uh, several decades, and, and as I said, a number of different sort of patterns have, been, have emerged, of which this is one of the most prominent. Um, now, as I've described this to you, we, we I, I just showed you a pool of V4 neurons and what they do typically. Uh, but the cortex isn't a pool of neurons. The cortex is, a, is an intricately organized laminar structure. Um, and the, the layers of this, of this cortical structure have meaning. So for example, in the primary visual cortex, the feed-forward input from the lateral geniculate nucleus is predominantly into layer 4C. The superficial layer cells contain pyramidal neurons that project to higher order visual areas. Layer 5 contains pyramidal cells that project down to the superior colliculus, and layer 6 has cells that project to and inhibit the activity of the lateral geniculate nucleus. So one of the goals of the research in my laboratory is to understand attentional modulation as a function of the cell's position within this la laminar circuit. I will not talk about that very much today. Another form of organization here is illustrated here, 
and that is the diversity of cell types that are present within the cortical circuit. So the, about 70 to 80 percent of the neurons within the cortical circuit are pyramidal cells, and these include all of the cells that project from a cortical area into another area, and they're embedded within a network of local interneurons, of which there are a number of different types that differ in their biophysical properties uh, and, the, and, and a number of other properties, including the, the ways in which they synapse on their target neurons. Now this looks like a somewhat complicated picture, but we can distill it down somewhat by noting that approximately half of the interneurons are of this type. They're parvalbumin expressing neurons. Parvalbumin is a calcium binding protein and is one of the, uh, one of the things that give these, gives these neurons a lot of speed. Um, these neurons, um, the remaining half of the interneurons uh, uh, do not express parvalbumin. And this has opened the door a little bit to, uh, to, to our ability to distinguish cell types in vivo as the monkey's performing the task. So here I'm showing you intracellular recordings that were made in the slice from an identified pyramidal cell and an identified parvalbumin expressing fast spiking interneuron. And what you see is that the duration of the parvalbumin cell's action potential is much reduced relative to the longer duration pyramidal cell action potential. And the biophysics of this has been studied in great detail. The primary difference between these two classes of cells is that the fast spiking interneurons express a, strongly a, uh, a type of potassium channel or a couple of different types of, of potassium channels known as the KB3.1 types. Now, that is intracellular recording, which is very difficult to do in the awake behavior monkey. But extracellular uh, action potentials are related systematically to the shape of the intracellular action potential. So to a first approximation, the, extra sensor, the extracellular action potential is, uh, is, is, is well modeled by the, by the first derivative of the intracellular action potential. So brief intracellular action potentials give rise to brief extracellular action potentials. And that's a very exciting idea for us because it means that we can begin to, just by listening to the shape of the action potential, tell whether we're listening to a putative pyramidal cell or a putative fast spiking interval. These are recordings, therefore, which we've gone and made in, in uh, area B4 as the monkey performed the attention task I just described to you. And here is an example of a narrow spiking cell and a broad spiking cell. If we compute the duration of the action potential, which is just the, the difference in time between the trough of the action potential at its peak, we can uh, examine, well, we see here, uh, that they, and I've color-coded them to help you see them, that there is a population of cells that seem to have a shorter duration action potential uh, waveform and then another population that appears to be broader in its action potential. And if we just plot the temporal, the, that trough to peak measure, we can see that there's a clear bimodal distribution. So we have two different classes of cells that uh, presumably are different, differing from one another in their KD 3.1 channels. And although there is some subtlety to this interpretation, which I'd be happy to talk about, uh, I think it's safe to say that the majority of these pyramidal uh, of these broad spiking cells are pyramidal cells and the majority of these narrow spiking cells are fast spiking inhibitory interneurons. So this allows us to begin to think about models of the circuitry that mediates the sorts of effects that I just showed you. For example, we could imagine a disinhibition model of attention in which when attention is directed to a stimulus, um, this has the effect of inactivating or reducing the firing rates of inhibitory interneurons and allowing the, the pyramidal cells, now uninhibited, to send their signals at higher firing rates to other areas. So this is a, this is a sort of a diagram of a model that David Heger and I developed, which, we were, which, which, uh, which, which is um, being co-opted here to illustrate the disinhibition model. And so again, the idea here is when attention is directed to the stimulus, this reduces inhibitory uh, inputs to cells, and, and it reduces the activity of inhibitory neurons and that uh, frees the signal to go forward from the pyramidal cell. Now a prediction of that model would then be that if we look at these two separate classes of cells, the putative pyramidal cells would be the ones that show attention dependent increases in firing rate, whereas the narrow spiking putative interneurons should show attention dependent reductions in firing rate. So we've separated that same index that I showed you earlier out according to broad versus narrow spiking cells. And what you see is that the putative pyramidal cells show quite a heterogeneous pattern of, of attentional modulation. Some of them do show highly significant increases in firing rate, but a number of them show reductions in firing rate. 
When we look instead at the inter interneuron population, we find that that cell population, if modulated by attention, is uniformly showing an increase in firing rate. So this, de this, this increase in inhibitory neuronal activity is really inconsistent with this disinhibition model. Uh, the model that uh, David and I uh, developed to account for this and a bunch of other experimental findings we refer to as the normalization model of attention. And the gist of the model is this. The visual system uh, has evolved to maintain its sensitivity across, across a, a wide range of intensities. So if we come from a darkened room to the sunlight, not only do we have a reduced pupillary size, but we also reduce the sensitivity of cortical neurons, LGN neurons, retinal neurons. The whole system shuts down in its sensitivity. And we, we propose that the circuitry that allows the brain to adjust its sensitivity to match the environment the cortical part of that has been co-opted by evolution to allow us to modulate the circuitry and control the sensitivity. So instead of just reacting to the environment, we can increase sensitivity to things we care about, and we can suppress the activity of stimuli that we don't care about. So this model, uh, this, this is the same circuit diagram, but here the proposal is that when attention is directed uh, to the receptive field, it has an effect very much like elevation of luminance contrast. So here, we've started with a a low contrast grading, and we uh, have increased the contrast. And the effect of this is to increase excitatory inputs, but through their inhibitory connections, they cause a proportional increase in inhibitory drive. Uh, and the proposal is that the feedback signals that I showed you earlier from the ocular motor system and other attentional control centers are operating on the same circuitry but instead of, of relying on an increase in the physical luminance contrast of the stimulus, they are in some way increasing the efficacy of excitatory and inhibitory uh, inputs, uh, which would be consistent with what I've just shown you, which is that the inhibitory neurons show an increase in firing rate precisely because they're part of this circuitry that controls gain control. Okay? So let's break that apart a little bit by illustrating a couple of examples. So suppose we now have a stimulus sitting at the cell's receptive field center. We can find a location in, in the surround of the classical receptive field, where if we present a second stimulus, this will have the effect of suppressing the activity of the, of the stimulus positioned in the center. Uh, the prediction of the model is, number one, that if we direct attention to the center stimulus, then this will increase both the excitatory and inhibitory drive that are being driven by that center stimulus. And because they have increased, they will have proportionally more impact on the firing rate of the cell. And any suppressive effect that is derived from the presence of the surround stimulus will be diminished. If, on the other hand, we direct attention towards the stimulus in the surround, we are again magnifying the excitatory and inhibitory drive associated with this stimulus. But for the cell we're recording from, that is only activating this inhibitory. And therefore, the effect of directing attention into the surround, to the suppressive stimulus in the surround, will be to magnify its inhibitory contribution to the firing rate of the cell, to magnify its suppressive effect in the surround. So in our, in our experiment, we can direct attention away from the receptive field. We can have a stimulus sitting inside the classical receptive field. And here I've just drawn a larger circle to indicate the, the, the suppressive surround region for the cell. If we move, the stimulus that was sitting far from the classical receptive field into the center, we have been able to identify a position that causes suppression. So this is an example of a before neuron. The red line shows the firing rate when the center stimulus appears alone. And the blue line shows the, su the, the suppressed response when, the monkey, when, when we've added this uh, suppressive stimulus in the surround of the receptive field. And so the test of the model is now to redirect attention to either the center stimulus or the surround stimulus and see its effect on the suppressive effect of the surround stimulus. So here for this neuron, when we direct attention to the center, just as predicted by the model, the degree of suppression, which moments ago was large, is now strongly reduced. Whereas in the same neuron, if we then direct the monkey to attend to the surround stimulus, then the suppressive effect of the surround stimulus is strongly magnified. So this is one line of several that I only have time to present briefly to you. Um, that, that in fact we, we think that, 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 that this is a plausible model of attention, that, that we're in some way, which I'll hint at a little bit more in a more uh, sophisticated model in a moment, we're uh, we magnifying the efficacy of excitatory and inhibitory drives from the attended stimulus, and this has the effect of, of, of minimizing the impact of unattended stimuli, suppressing the activity. So, so now if, I, if we're directing attention here, 
the firing rate that's evoked by this now task irrelevant stimuli is suppressed. So it's a kind of competitive circuit for selection of targets among distractors, suppressing distractors and selecting targets. Now this uh, is part of decades of work that have, have shown that attention does modulate the mean firing rates of cells. But a very talented postdoctoral researcher, Jude Mitchell, and a graduate student, Christy Sunberg, also really an excellent uh, scientist, work together to make a, a very important discovery, which is that attention also reduces response variability. And this is illustrated here. This is the same example neuron that I showed you earlier when I was introducing the task. And as you'll recall, when attention is directed into the receptive field, the cell evokes a higher firing rate than when the monkey tends away from the receptive field. But if you look at the pattern of, of responses in the unattended condition, they seem more variable. There are gaps of time where there are no spikes and there are little periods of time when the cell fires bursts of action potentials. And if you um, simply count up the number of spikes within this thousand millisecond period of time and compute the standard deviation of the spike count across trials, you can see that for this neuron, the standard deviation is lower when the monkey attends into the receptive field than when he attends away from the receptive field. And this is the opposite of what you would expect from what is a very common model of spiking activity, which is that the spiking activity follows a Poisson distribution. So a Poisson process is like a Geiger counter. It can have a rate that varies with radiation level or with the, uh, with the cognitive state of the monkey or uh, its response to the stimulus. But each spike occurs independent of the history of, of prior spiking. And that uh, sort of a process, a first order model neuron would have uh, shown an elevation of, of variability that scaled with firing rate. So this is actually quite a, quite a remarkable thing to see a reduction in variability despite an increase in firing rate. So one way of, of quantifying this is to compute a measure, this, this, the, the noisiness of the signal, is to compute a measure known as the Fano factor, which is just the variance of the spike count divided by the mean spike count. If the neuron were a Poisson process, this would have a value of 1. Um, so a value greater than 1 means that the neuron is noisier, uh, and smaller values means that it's more reliable. And, and um, so we can quantify that, oops, I'm missing part of my neuronal response somehow. Uh, we can quantify that measure. This is a measure of, of let's, let's call it uh, noise to signal ratio. So a large value uh, greater than 0 would correspond to cells that become more noisy when the monkey attends into the receptive field whereas values less than zero correspond to cells that become less noisy. And so they, they, the, the main finding of this study was that, uh, that there's a marked reduction in the degree of variability in the neuronal response, and that improves the quality of the signal. Um, but one might say, well, is this really an important discovery? Because I know that, my, that each neuron is receiving hundreds or thousands of synaptic inputs from other cells in the population. If the variability is independent across the population of cells that are feeding into this individual neuron, then uh, by averaging over a large enough po population of input neurons, we can average away all of the variability. It would be just like a stock market portfolio in which all of the stocks are statistically independent. The more stocks you add to the portfolio, the lower your level of fluctuation. On the other hand, if the variability that we're looking at here is shared across the population, then you can't do that. Then a downstream neuron that pulls away all of the statistically independent noise is left with the statistically codependent noise. And so a very important question to follow up here was whether neuronal responses co-vary in their, in their random fluctuations and whether that covariance is then reduced by attention. And to motivate this, I have a movie here which was provided to me by my friend Adam Cohn. This is a recording made in the primary visual cortex. Each row here is not now a trial, but is one neuron, and all of these neurons are being recorded simultaneously. And what you're seeing is that as he presented different drifting gradients, you can see the visual response evoked by those gradients. But remarkably, if you remove the stimulus from the screen, you can find that the cell sometimes fires huge waves of activity, like here. Very great level of activity, separated by periods of relative quiescence. So the, the image that emerges from this is that the brain is not in a quiescent state waiting for a stimulus to come along and fire neurons and give us a stimulus evoke response. It's actually a, a hugely fluctuating um, population. And there are strong correlations in the firing rates of the neurons. And these are superimposed on the stimulus evoke response. So, 
If you imagine now recording from two neurons, this one here and this one here, in response to a, cup, to a grading, and here I'm just plotting the response to neuron one against the response to neuron two, and this is just to illustrate the point. This is sort of hypothetical data. Suppose we recorded the responses of these two neurons to a rightward drifting grading uh, that's slightly tilted to the right. Uh, these will evoke uh, a mean response in each of the two neurons, but as I've just shown you, the variability around that mean is correlated across the two cells. And so when we move away from that mean, if, if cell one fired at a higher firing rate, cell two will tend to fire at a higher rate, firing rate, and, and the same if the two of them are a little bit below average. And so, so why is that an issue? Well, let's suppose now that we're recording from another neuron, uh, uh, from the same two neurons, but now we're presenting a stimulus that's leftward leaning, and our task is just take the responses of these two cells and tell me whether the grading was to the right or to the left. Well, again, the positive correlation in the, in the, in the, in the fluctuations around the mean means that, uh, that that task is complicated because there is extensive overlap between the distributions of responses uh, to the two stimuli. So if we, on a given stimulus presentation, were to get this firing rate, we couldn't tell if it had been generated by this stimulus or by that stimulus. And so the question then is, how do we diminish the degree of overlap between these two distributions so that we, as an ideal observer, or a neuron downstream of these two neurons, can infer the identity of the stimulus? Well, one way of doing that is the first thing I showed you, an increase in gain. If we increase gain, because the variance uh, grows more slowly than the mean, I mean, that is, the standard deviation grows more slowly than the mean, the, the, the more we increase the gain, the less overlap there is between the two populations. So increasing gain can improve signal quality. Another approach, though, is to remove the correlations between the noise. If we do that, then again, we can diminish the degree to which the populations of responses are overlapping, and we can make better inferences about the stimulus. Okay. Um, and so we went back to our recordings in Area B4 to ask, does attention reduce these correlations? Does it do the second thing as well as the first thing that I've already shown you? Uh, so here is a, a V4 neuronal response plotted against another when a stimulus appeared within the receptive field of the cell, but the monkey was directed to attend away from the receptive field. And again, as, as I showed you in the, in the toy example, there's a correlation between the firing rates of the cells. The stimulus is always constant, so these are, these are fluctuations in the noisiness of the neuronal response that are covariant. So the question is, what happens when we now take attention and direct it into the receptive field of the cell? And what we see is that the correlation that was there in the, in the attend away condition is drastically reduced for this pair of neurons. And if we look across the entire population, we find that the, that the correlation when attention is directed into the receptive field is reduced by a factor of two. So that's a substantial change in the correlational structure. But how do we quantify that? Oh, uh, before I go there, I, we, we, as I showed you in the movie, the stimuli pause for a second within the receptive field. So this means that we can characterize these correlations as a function of frequency. So this is a plot showing the spike-to-spike -spike coherence, a sort of measure of correlation, um, as a function of frequency. And so what it's showing us is that that the correlations I showed you, those fluctuations that you also saw in the primary visual cortical movie, are low frequency. You saw big, long gaps of time with no spiking interspersed with long periods of time of high firing rate, and that's because much of these fluctuations are low frequency. The blue line shows uh, the average across 236 pairs of neurons uh, when the monkey was attending away from the receptive field, and you can see this, this halving of that correlated variability. Uh, and, and how it occurs primarily in low frequency ranges. So it's a big effect, and we can quantify its impact on the quality of the neuronal signal as follows. So um, as I kind of hinted at, if you have correlations, then once you have a population of neurons in your input that are sufficiently large to average out the uncorrelated part of the noise, you can't get rid of the correlated component. And so what that means is that the degree of correlation places an upper asymptote on the pooled neuronal signal-to-noise ratio. In other words, it says you can get this good by looking at the average across a large population of neurons, but you can do no better. So we calculated that curve as a function of, of, of a hypothesized pool of neurons. So this would be 
if we were looking at a node that received only one input, 10 inputs, 100, 1,000, or 10,000, we calculated that curve and, and computed the signal to noise ratio of the pooled population uh, when the monkey was attending away from the receptive field of the cell. And we asked what would happen if we allowed only the first thing I showed you, the increase in gain to occur. And the answer is that it modestly improves the signal to noise ratio. The asymptotic le level of signal to noise increases by 10%. So it's a, a, uh, an improvement, but it's a modest improvement. We then said, well, what happens if we hold the mean firing rates of the neurons constant, but allow the covariance structure to change as it was experimentally observed to change in before? In that case, we saw a much larger uh, signal to noise ratio improvement of about 39%. And when we combine the two, I don't show it here, but the improvement is a 50% improvement in signal to noise. And so a way of saying that is that the, the thing we've been studying for the last several decades, this change in mean firing rate in our hands accounts for 20% of the improvement due to attending to the stimulus, whereas this newly discovered form of attentional modulation is 80% of the gain. So it's therefore uh, interesting to us to begin to to, to ask how is it that these correlations initially occur, and then what, is, what are the neural mechanisms that reduce the correlations? And so this is work that was carried out by a very talented graduate student, Emily Anderson, who's now doing a postdoc with Lauren Frank at UCSF in collaboration with Jude Mitchell. Um, and I don't have time to go into this in too much depth, but anyone who's interested in discussing this with me, I'd really be happy to go into more detail. So this is a, a neural network model in which we have incorporated realistic numbers of pyramidal cells and inhibitory interneurons and we've used realistic uh, synaptic dynamics and we uh, and it is a it's a conductance based model so we we generate uh, slightly varying synaptic inputs and the response of the cell is then governed by a system of differential equations that reflect all of the things that contribute to changes in the membrane the depolarization state and so as, as excitatory and inhibitory <coughs> conductances are open, this leads to fluctuations in the intercellular potential, which when they reach a, the spike threshold for the cell, uh, activate potassium channels, which then lead to an action potential. Sometimes these action potentials in the model come in bursts, and sometimes they come in singletons. And um, because we have essentially two types of connections here. We have feedforward inputs to the network, let's say from V2 to V4, and we have all of the recurrent connectivity, which is uh, connected in a pattern that's, that, that, is, uh, that is based on true connectivity patterns between neurons within the cortex. We can separate out the effects of the recurrent in the model, the recurrent and the feedforward input. So we can take the recurrent, net, uh, the, the feedforward inputs, and we can, uh, for example, shut them off. So here, I've uh, organized the differential equation that governs the change in the depolarization state of the cell and separated the variables out into the feed-forward conductances and the recurrent conductances. All right. So one way of thinking about this is that the, all of the synapses that combine to give you the feed-forward inputs to the cell have a preferred level of depolarization, which is fluctuating over time as the inputs come in from below. And all of the synapses that correspond to the recurrent components of the network are themselves favoring the cell to adopt a certain depolarization state. So you could even think about a kind of fluctuating reversal potential that's associated with the feedforward and the recurrent components. So we can disable the feedforward components, just set the feedforward conductances to zero, and we can observe the, fun the operation of the network. And this is shown here, so this is this network represented as a set of pixels. And what you can see, so each pixel here corresponds to one of the model neurons in the system. And what you can see is that there are periods of quiescence, like in V1. But every so often, the configuration of spiking, the spiking activity being the little flashes of red, occurs in such a way that because of the connectivity pattern of the network, it leads to a propagating wave of activity that comes across the cortical sheet. And uh, we found that if we incorporate realistic dynamics, including particularly NMDA receptor dynamics, then this imposes the right time scale to give rise to these low frequency fluctuations. So if we go back to our model system and we go across pairs of model neurons and compute this coherence, this spiking coherence metric, the same one I just showed you for the V4 cells, we can see that as a result of the NMDA receptor dynamics, we have uh, slow fluctuations, slow degrees of correlation between pairs of neurons within the network. 
that are similar to what we, what we observe experimentally. And this is in the case where the monkey is directing attention away from the receptive field. We um, have incorporated into this model the idea that came from the original model that I was telling you about, that when attention is directed to a stimulus, this scales the excitatory and inhibitory inputs to the cell. So what that corresponds to is a scaling here of the conductances, the excitatory and inhibitory conductances that are related to the feed-forward input to, to each of the neurons. Um, conceptually, a way of thinking about this is to compute the, the asymptotic firing rate, the target to which the depolarization is moving, um, and break it into a feed-forward component and a return component. And what you can see is that this is essentially a weighted average of the effects of feed-forward inputs and recurrent inputs. In other words, this is a normalization process, much like the normalization process in the, in the original model that I showed you. In other words, another way of putting it is that the change in voltage over time is proportional to uh, two components, the feed-forward component and the return component. So these two components are really in competition with one another. And by elevating the contrast of the stimulus or elevating the efficacy of the feed-forward inputs that are, that are being modulated by attention, we can balance, shift the balance of competition uh, away from the recurrent connections that give rise to these correlations and in favor of the feed-forward inputs that are driven by the visual stimulus. So if we do that, if we increase, if we allow the excitatory and inhibitory conductances of the feed-forward inputs to the cell to increase when attention is directed into the receptive field, we see that we can cause a reduction in these low-frequency correlations. Okay, so what this represents is a very well-defined hypothesis about what the cortical circuitry is that gives rise to these correlations and its reduction, the reduction of these correlations by increasing the excitatory and inhibitory synaptic conductances, which match the pattern that we observe experimentally in area before. So it's a, it's, a, it's a model in the sense that we've been able to use a, a, a well-formulated, conductance-based network model to account for our experimental observations. But the real value of modeling comes from whether it makes predictions and whether, we can, and, and, those, and whether those predictions are testable. And so two, model, two predictions that follow from this model are the following. One is that attention will reduce burst firing. So um, you can see that this neuron evokes some, this model neuron evokes some action potentials in bursts and others that are singletons. This bursting behavior occurs as a result of the interaction between two of the channels that are in the model. One of them are persistent sodium channels, which contribute to the repetitive bursting behavior. But the other is this muscarine-sensitive, voltage-sensitive, voltage-gated uh, potassium channel, which is a hyperpolarizing channel. And when it's activated, it has the effect of acting as a brake on the bursting behavior of the cell. In fact, the Hodgkin-Huxley model neuron that we've adopted for this model was originally developed as a way of accounting for changes in burst behavior. Excuse me, what's the time scale here? So what is the sense of what you're talking about? Uh, so these bursts are uh, occurring within two to four milliseconds of one another. So, so that, that's, this, the distance here is two to four milliseconds between each This voltage sensitive, muscarine sensitive potassium channel has a slow time constant. So it has, uh, so it's not sensitive to little fluctuations in voltage, but if you do something like activate, increase the, the conductance of excitatory and inhibitory <coughs> inputs to the cell, that has the effect of leading to a persistent elevation in the, in the depolarization of the cell and activates the potassium channel. And the, the potassium channel then inhibits the production of bursts. And so uh, we can measure this here. So here is two milliseconds and four milliseconds is about right here. So this peak in this model neuron corresponds to this model neuron's tendency to fire action potentials in bursts. Okay? Um, we can uh, go into area V4 where there are bursty cells and there are less bursty cells. This is an example of a, of a cell that, that is highly bursty. Um, and we can, we can um, uh, I should mention, David Golan's work, he developed the, the initial bursting model. So the prediction of the model is that we should see an attention-dependent reduction in burstiness as a result of activation of this potassium channel. This is a very counterintuitive prediction because many who study burstiness regard bursts as special packets of information. 
if I'm a downstream neuron and I receive several action potentials in close proximity to one another, then I will be much more likely to be driven to my depolarization or my spiking threshold and evoke an action potential. And so, so one, of the, one of the ideas in, in this field is that attention should increase the burst rate because it will increase the degree to which cells are sending special packets of information to downstream neurons. This model makes the opposite prediction, and so the question is, what do we see in the cells? And of course, if I were to, if I, if I didn't find this, I would be telling you about this particular, in this particular <laughs> way. We do find that actually uh, area B4 cells show a marked reduction in their tendency to fire action potentials in bursts when the monkey directs its attention to the receptive field. And so this is a prediction that really came completely out of a model that was designed to account for something occurring even on a different time scale, which is these low frequency fluctuations. Another thing that you may have noticed is that the spike amplitude here uh, changes over time. So this is a well understood phenomenon. When a spike occurs, this inactivates sodium channels. And those sodium channels are less available then to participate in closely successive uh, action potentials. And this results in a reduction in the amplitude of the, of, the, uh, of the action potential. Now, one way of looking at this is the height of the action potential, which has now just been normalized to one for an unadapted spike. So let's say this is one. If we look at the height of, of the model neuron's action potential as a result of this inactivation of sodium channels, we see that for short periods of time following the spike, the cell, the subsequent spike will be shorter in amplitude, but if we wait a while, then it'll return to its unadapted state. Okay, so we inactivate sodium channels, but they shorten the spike height for a, for a period of time. Uh, we see exactly the same pattern when we look within uh, area V4 neurons. This is an example of, a, of a now an extracellular action potential. And this is for spikes of this cell that were preceded by a period of 100 to 200 milliseconds of silence. So this is a relatively unadapted action potential. I'm going to tighten up that duration. So in other words, I'm moving the preceding spike closer and closer to the one you're seeing. And as I do that, here are 32 to 100 milliseconds, 4 to 32 milliseconds, what you see is that the action potential grows shorter and shorter. So this is well understood, hasn't been documented before in a monkey, but this is really due to the inactivation of sodium channels. And so V4 neurons show this pattern um, uh, of shorter action potentials uh, for a short period of time, followed by return to their full amplitude. That, but, think about this, we have uh, just posited that we increase the efficacy of excitatory and inhibitory conductances. Those conductances have reversal potentials, here 0 and negative 50, which are hyperpolarized with respect to the peak of the action potential. So that means that when an action potential occurs, these reversal potentials are drawing the spike back down towards their preferred reversal potential, and the sort of magnetism they have to draw the spike down to these levels of, of reversal potential increases with the conductance of the channel. All right? So as we turn up the conductances, we're drawing the membrane potential towards these reversal potentials. And at the time of a spike, uh, this will have the effect of drawing the spike downward. Okay? So a hypothesis of the model is that in addition to this spike history dependent form of spike adaptation, attention should draw the spike downward and result in an additional reduction of the action potential height. If you think about that, to me, this is just amazing. We're talking about a change of cognitive state that results in a spatially selective reduction in the height of action potentials. And when we first began to think about this, it seemed ridiculous to me that this could be true. But in fact, when we look within uh, area B4 cells, we find this uh, attention-dependent reduction in action potential height. This is data on the right. This is data on the right. And so this is uh, probably, I would think, not functionally relevant. We're not improving signal quality by shortening action potentials. But I think it is a surprising and strongly endorsing uh, finding. I mean, it's, a, it's a kind of a counterintuitive and surprising finding of the model that we find uh, holds across the population of cells in V4. And so now, I, you know, I've told you so far about how we can cause changes in firing rate, how we can change the variability of the neuronal response, that it is, in fact, correlated variability that's being reduced largely, um, and that this improves signal quality. And I've introduced a model in which we increase the excitatory and inhibitory conductances to the cell, and we can account for these different phenomena. 
Uh, and that's reassuring, but the direction that we're now moving is to try and go beyond the combination of correlation and modeling uh, and incorporate the ability to causally manipulate the circuit. Uh, and this is really work that's just getting started in the lab, uh, and it's being led by a really talented postdoc, Jojo Nassi. Uh, and so what Jojo is, is doing is he's lowering electrodes into the brain, and he's actually currently working in primary visual cortex as we fine-tune the technique, but we'll eventually move to D4. And uh, at the same time that he's recording active potentials, he is delivering light, which activates um, cells that have been genetically modified to express a protein that's sensitive to life. Okay? So I'll illustrate this here. Uh, so this, this approach, which is actually adopted based on work of Ralph uh, Siegel, uh, and is to remove the uh, dura matter that protects the brain and replace it with a transparent window made of silicon. And so what you're looking at here is the view into a recording chamber over the primary visual cortex. This is the lunate sulcus, and anterior to the lunate sulcus is the area I've been telling you about, area V4. This region here is area V2, and then behind area V2 is area V1. And what we uh, and and the reason for uh, for removing this artificial dura will become uh, removing the native dura and replacing it with this artificial dura. Uh, will become evident in several ways, but the first of these is that we can now visualize the brain that we are studying. So we can see beautifully this vasculature map that allows us to inject with a glass pipette um, viruses at different positions within the chamber. And the viruses uh, infect <coughs> cells and cause the cells to give expression to opsins, proteins that are light sensitive and allow us to control the activity of the neuron. And so the overarching goal here is then to use this technique as a way of directly manipulating activity within the circuit and test some of the ideas that I've just been telling you about. This is a, also, in addition to just giving us the ability to see the brain that we're recording from and to localize things using the vascular map, it also avoids two major problems with this approach that have plagued the field. The first is that in order to that if you do not remove the dura matter, this very thick leather, which in the monkey is sort of like sticking something through a glove, um, you have to find a way of, of delivering the virus. And so the, the way that we and others have been using to do this is to take a, a, a needle, essentially, place an electrode inside it. Since we can't visualize the brain, we lower the needle into the brain and we record the receptive fields of cells. And we use that as a way of knowing where we are in the, in the visual area. So we're in the retinotopic map, let's say in V1, we know that we're at, at a certain position in space, and that, uh, that is our, our method of localization. The problem is that this, electro, this, this, this needle is very large, and we're just making coring out the tissue, this beautifully organized cortical circuit that, that we're studying, each time we inject the virus. So we're putting the virus exactly where we're destroying the tissue. Then, even worse, we go in with a, an electrode which is attached to a fiber optic cable. This is about a 200, it could be reduced to 100 microns, uh, but still, uh, it's like sticking a fence post into the, into the tissue that you study. So again, you have, uh, you're, you're doing enormous damage each day that you make a recording. And we make recordings hundreds of days in the same cortex, so by the time you're done with your experiment, you have a <coughs> cortex in that region. And so by using the artificial dura approach, we can use a very fine glass pipette, diameter about 30 to 40 microns. We can either inject, we can place the pipette through the pia matter after removing the dura, which is fine. And then because the artificial dura can be penetrated by the glass pipette easily, we can then subsequently go in in surgery, but under anesthesia, but, uh, but without removing the artificial dura, we can place additional virus as we need to as, as the story unfolds, as the experiment unfolds. And then we can then avoid entirely the use of this technology because now we lower the electrode through the artificial dura, but this big fence post sits on top of the artificial dura and it transluminates the brain across this, uh, this window. Another benefit of this, it's a little hard to see in this picture, but you can just make out some little green spots here. The opsins that we are causing to be expressed are, are GFP tagged opsins. So by using fluorescence, we can visualize the expression of the protein over time, which again, for a monkey experiment is kind of critical. We're gonna work with the animal for a year or six months following injection of the virus. This allows us to directly visualize the expression of the protein so we can see that it continues to be healthy and, and protein expressing 
over the duration of the experiment. Uh, I, a caveat is that over time, this beautiful uh, ability to visualize the, the vasculature and to illuminate the brain becomes somewhat more challenging by the emergence of this cloudy tissue that grows as part of the natural immune response. But what we can do is we can just pop this artificial dura out, remove this white tissue, and then return the tissue to its original state. So you can see very clearly the original vasculature. This is at 28, one, 28 weeks after, after uh, placing the chamber. And this chamber was placed on Valentine's Day, so now it's about eight and a half months out, and we're making great uh, progress. We record daily from the cells, and we can modulate them each day. This is a little bit of detail. Uh, the main thing that I want to show is just that uh, we have a, a DPSS laser that we can control with a mechanical shutter and also with this optical shutter. This allows us to precisely control the level of illumination, and we actually measure it with a, a, half, a, a, a mirror that siphons off 1% of the light that goes to an optical uh, a, 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 a diode which has been calibrated. It sends a voltage signal into our system, so we actually know exactly the number of milliwatts per millimeter squared of the laser going into the brain. It's part of our data record. Um, <clears throat> another technical detail is that we also um, face this challenge, which is the heartbeat. So the artificial dura is, is uh, thin enough that it doesn't inhibit the motion due to the heartbeat. And that's a potential problem for isolating cells if we Compare that with the figure on the right here. I'm um, sorry, my this one is not running yet, and this one is not running. This is a movie, not a picture. What you can see is that here we've inserted a ring with a little plastic component, and that holds the tissue down so that we can avoid that motion artifact. So if you zoom in now within that little plastic insert that's sitting on the artificial dura. We have an electrode here, and this is our, um, this is our fiber optic laser, um, uh, laser delivery system. And so we can, uh, we can, through this hole, make recordings while we're activating the cell and get very good isolation of cells. And these are just illustrated in this figure. So here is a cell that, that whose isolation is, is good, and this one is a broad spiking cell, so a putative pyramidal cell. We have, in this case, been using a lentivirus with a CAM kinase promoter, which combine together to lead to exclusive expression in pyramidal cells. And the opsin that we're using to uh, control the activity of the cell is a, an opsin known as C1V1, which is one of the latest depolarizing opsins from Carl Dyseroth's lab. So what we're doing is we're turning on pyramidal cells. Pyramidal cells are excitatory cells. This is an example of a putative pyramidal cell, and you can see that uh, this is its spontaneous activity, and as we introduce light, we can drive the firing rate of the cell, this is the duration of the laser, at 10 milliwatts per millimeter squared, 25, 50, and 125, so you can see uh, both in the raster plot and also in the average firing rate that we can very precisely control, and if you look at the, the, the amount of time here, it's about a two millisecond delay between turning the light on and spiking uh, activity. Uh, but intriguingly, we also find examples of cells like this. So this act happens to be a narrow spiking cell, so it's probably a parvalgumin expressing interneuron. And what you can see is that it has a fairly high spontaneous activity, and as we elevate the laser, what we're doing is actually shutting off this cell. And so it, since the opsins are purely depolarizing and they're only expressed in excitatory cells, what this must mean is that this cell is receiving not only perhaps some excitation directly from an activated pyramidal cell or from another indirectly activated pyramidal cell, but it's also receiving inhibitory input from other inhibitory neurons that are being activated indirectly by the, by the delivery of light. And so I, you know, I began my talk by talking about this competitive circuitry that allows us to direct attention to one stimulus and suppress nearby distractors, which involves activation of inhibitory circuitry. And so I think what we're doing in this uh, experiment is by activating the excitatory cells, we're in, indirectly activating the entire uh, circuitry that we think is involved in both contrast gain control in response to changes in the external world and also attentional modulation. And so if uh, people are interested, we can talk about how this tool might be useful in testing some of these uh, theories that I just outlined for you. Um, 
Uh, just to close the story, these are plots showing the firing rates of cells, triangles being well-isolated units, circles being multi-unit activity. Uh, we're plotting here the firing rate in the absence of the laser and when the laser turned on at different levels of irradiance, light, weak laser, stronger, stronger, and strongest. And what you can see is that at each of these, at each of these levels of irradiance, there are a lot of cells that show laser-dependent activation, but there is this persistent population of cells that show laser-dependent suppression. And so I imagine what is happening is that the virus infects cells with some probabilistic distribution. They give rise to the depolarizing opsin. The laser hits some of them strongly enough to drive them. And then we're recording from a neuron that's receiving a mixture of the population of excitatory and inhibitory cells that are activated. And if that mixture favors inhibition, we get suppression. If the, if the mixture favors um, excitation, we get, uh, we get an increase in firing rate. And this just shows the time course of this. So this is the population average response across the 61 uh, units that were significantly excited by the laser. So there's the spontaneous rate. You can see that this looks very much like to a, what a visual neurophysiologist would say looks like a lower and up to a higher contrast visual input. So it's very much like we're driving the same circuitry that's being driven by visual inputs. And these are just the uh, population of 18 neurons that were suppressed by the activation of the laser. So I've gone over a huge amount of material pretty quickly. Let me just remind you what I just said, and I'll be happy to take any questions. So, so uh, we were focused on trying to understand the cortical circuit within the macaque, and I've shown you that attention towards the stimulus in the cell's receptive field leads to a variety of different effects, including attention-dependent increases in firing rate, and I also showed you how it can bias competition between center and surround stimulus, so it can suppress responses to distractors. But then I showed you that, well, is that, whereas that's a well-established and important part of the story, uh, there is also this pronounced low-frequency fluctuation that is reduced by attention, and that the improvement in signal-to-noise due to this attention-dependent reduction in correlated variability is the majority of the benefit of attention, at least in our hands. Uh, and then I introduced a, a, a more sophisticated version of the same normalization circuit, but here conductance-based and, and generating realistic spiking behavior. And I showed you that uh, it could, that a network of neurons of this sort naturally give rise to low-frequency correlations. And then I showed you that the model made two predictions, one of them being an attention-dependent reduction in burst firing, the other being the surprising prediction of a reduction in action potential height. Uh, and then I introduced this new approach that we're taking to uh, primate optogenetics, which has really helped us uh, begin to make real progress in activating these circuitry so that we can test these ideas by establishing a causal link between activation of cells in an area like B4 and uh, the monkey's ability to, to uh, attend to one target while, while filtering out distractors. And with that, I'd like to just acknowledge the contributions of Emily Anderson here and Christy Sundberg, two really terrific graduate students, uh, both of whom stuck around for a while to work as postdocs in the lab. Uh, Jude Mitchell, the senior postdoc in the lab, who's made contributions throughout uh, his time in the lab and recently uh, the addition of Jojo Nassi, who's really pioneered the effort to bring um, the artificial Dura approach into the lab for use in optogenetics. We're grateful for, for the support of the Gatsby Charitable Foundation, the Swartz Foundation for Computational Neuroscience, and the National Eye Institute. And I would also like to acknowledge the contributions of Tom Albright and Anna Rowe, Gene Sunner, and Octavia Ruiz, with whom we've worked closely on the development of the optical window approach, Ed Calloway for his his help in, uh, in, in selecting and developing new viral tools for targeting, and Carl Dyseroth, who's a, one of our Gatsby Consortium <coughs> members who's provided the options that we've used in the optogenetics experiments. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. <laughs> or if I've exhausted you, I would be perfectly happy to drop it. <laughs> the back row, someone? Uh, do these B4 cells, are they modulated by fixational line movements? Are they modulated? Yes, they are. You can see if microsaccades lead to transient uh, responses. Uh, in that regard, then, um, this increase in correlation around like less than 5 hertz, can that be somehow related to fixational saccades because 
with increase in attention, the rate of saccades go down. Yeah, so, so we've looked at that. That was an important kind of control for us. Um, in fact, what we found was that the monkeys do tend to have a tendency to make micro saccades in the direction of the attended location. And so that could lead to an increase in low frequency fluctuations, potentially. And so the way that we control for that is we, our eye, eye measurement uh, system allows us to record eye movements down to 0.2 degrees of visual arc. And so we could measure empirically the way the eye moves over different distances down to that level of resolution. And the velocity, in fact, we can show that we can measure that because there's a linear <coughs> relationship between the maximum velocity of an eye movement and the distance. And so we could reproduce that down to 0.2 degrees of visual arc, which means we're capable of detecting anything down to that size. We then went into our data record and we took out, we first of all <coughs> extracted all of the recording that was done at the time of micro saccades. And we do see this, this transient response that's driven by the micro saccade. We looked at that separately in the two attention conditions. And what you see is that the uh, elevation and firing rate just rides right along the top of that transient response to the micro <coughs> So at least the firing rate increases that we see in the mean are not due to that. Uh, and we also looked at whether they were contributing to the other measures of variability, the Fano factor and the correlated <coughs> variability. And when we removed those segments that contained the micro we saw the same pattern. So in the absence of micro we still see the same low frequency fluctuations. In fact, these fluctuations are observed in the nesting <coughs> animals uh, and uh, where there are no eye movements. So we really don't believe that they're being generated by the, uh, by the micro -saccades. A very good candidate for, for generating these slow correlated oscillations is that the thalamus. I, I, I didn't hear you talk about that. Do you think it's a possibility? Yeah, so in fact, there's recently been some work done. I agree with you. I think the thalamus is contributing part of this. The, th the corticothalamic loop is a source of this. Um, we haven't looked at this. I would say the thalamocortical loop. <laughs> the thalamo the thalamocortical cortical thalamic loop. It's, <laughs> it's obviously as well. But yeah, so so uh, there's recent work in anesthetized animals looking at comparing the degree of correlation at successive stages of processing and looking at the degree to which correlations, let's say, in V2 can be predicted from those in V1. And they can be somewhat predicted. So that, what that says is that some of the variability that occurs in V1 is also observed in V2. <coughs> uh, but it hasn't really, I don't think we really have a good answer to whether that is a direct connection or an indirect connection. There's so also very, inactivation would be a very good thing. There's also very old work that, that shows how with slightly decreased arousal, yes. uh, increase synchrony via thalamocortical projection. Absolutely. So this is a very good case. Yeah, uh, certainly something we'd like to look at. Right. And, and literature I know pretty well. We need to we need to uh, to, to intervene. So inject musimol or use optogenetic approaches to silence mm -hmm. the thalamic input or the feedback from the cortex. But I think that yeah. Uh, the proposal, the model that I'm proposing to you is one in which, the jet, in which the generation of these waves is sufficient to give rise to the correlations we see, but I suspect that, that you know, it's a model. It's a model that needs to be tested. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just wondered about the, um, you were talking about when the unattended site, when, when, when your monkey's not attending, you see these correlations um, <coughs> along the, uh, the uh, uh, sweeps of firing of neurons in, in more of a local area um, and that when you switch attend and when you that the brain is actually able to that area is actually able to suppress some of those um, independent correlated um, functions <coughs> and I wondered what the effect of the larger up down fluctuations in brain oscillations have on that type of system and whether when the attendant, uh, when, they, when, they, when the attending is switched, that it actually uncorrelates a larger network than the one that you're looking at. That, does that make sense? Yeah, so I, I, I think this is a big open question. I mean, the degree to which up and down states are contributing and what their relationship is to, to, the, to the correlated variability, I think, is a, is a, is a good and open question. Uh, and the you know, work that people have done in primarily in anesthetized animals looking at up and down states may hint at mechanisms that may be contributing to this. Uh, in, our, in our case, in the awake state, 
Um, I mean, I've seen very large fluctuations in the sleeping state in the, in the monkeys as they doze off in the chair. Uh, these are low frequency, but our frequency range does extend. I mean, it goes up to 10 hertz, but it goes down to you know, as low as we can measure, essentially. So we've got a thousand millisecond stimulus, and we can therefore measure down to about two hertz reliably. But it could be that even lower frequency fluctuations are present and are modulated. But uh, as, far, as far down in frequency as we can go, we see that they are reduced. They are reduced. Well, because, you know, even in the waking state, you can see this sort of... Um, activity and it's not regular mm -hmm. and so I, I wondered how you're able to how you decide whether those are actually independent or, or, or uh, how much of that is independently correlated and how much of that is yeah so, so so the measure that we use to distinguish um, changes in variability like the burst firing that we see right. that's a source of fluctuation of firing rate on the you know, where during the burst period you have very high firing rates, and then during the interburst periods you have low firing rates. So there's a fluctuation that's occurring that is presumably private to each cell. Each cell has got its own potassium battle going on with its, you know, with the with the persistent sodium channels to determine whether that cell bursts. Uh, and that would be a source of, ind of statistically independent variability from cell to cell. The one that uh, the one that I think is probably more important for computation are the correlations. So there we're computing in a variety of ways. One is simply to count spikes over a window, say 100 milliseconds, in the two cells, and then look at their distribution. Another is to compute, which I think is a somewhat better measure, is to compute the coherence between the two spike trains. And that's where we see this really low, strong low frequency component. So, you know, those would be potentially related to weight, to, to, to up and down states, which are, you know, which can be observed across, across cells as well as within cells. Yeah. Do you have, when you do these electrical recordings, do you know roughly from which layer you're, you're recording? Because that could also be important for genetics, I assume you can only um, part the superficial layers yeah, with, your, so, with your laser beam. Right. So the laser itself will extend, we think, about three or four hundred microns into the tissue. So it's directly illuminating superficial layer cells only. Uh, but when we mark the depth, so, so we are recording now with laminar electrodes mm -hmm. to allow us to record simultaneously from the whole depth and to use current source density analysis to identify the layer. So, you know, when light comes in, the eye it provides input layers first, and they cause uh, excitatory currents into superficial and deep layers, and those are associated with return currents. And by decoding that, you can identify the input layer, the supragranular, and the infragranular layers. Uh, at this point, we're just getting started doing that. But um, what I can say in our genetic experiments is, is that we, as we advance the electrode, we mark the first well-isolated spike that we can identify, and then we go down from there and we ask how, how deep can we go and still see modulation. And we are uh, going to the full depth of the cortex. So even in the deepest layers, we see cells that are both showing uh, light-dependent excitation and inhibition. So this presumably is being activated either by, by probably a combination of things, but one of them is uh, opsins that are expressed in dendrites uh, that are directly activating say layer five uh, pyramidal cells that have dendrites that extend up into the superficial layers, um, as well as activating local circuits that either activate the dendrites or else have axons that extend down to the somas deeper in the, in the cortex. But I think this is going to be very important. So for example, in V4, the uh, strongest projection from the frontal eye field, the strongest glutamatergic projection from the frontal eye fields is into the superficial layers. And in fact, there's work from Larkin's lab showing that if we uh, depolarize the, den the, the apical dendrites of a layer 5 pyramidal cell, this has the effect of, by, by, by causing a backpropagating action potential to occur, which allows calcium currents to flow into the soma, it can, in a way, potentiate the cell, and it has the effect of multiplicatively scaling the, the, the efficacy of more somatic inputs. So the parts of the dendrite that are near the soma are more effective at driving the cell. And so I've shown you that attention increases the gain of neurons. And one way that may be happening is by this glutamatergic feedback from attentional control centers to superficial layers that could have the effect, that do have the effect of scaling the response to the, to the layer four inputs that are more proximal to the layer five cell. And so we really are, you know, one of our goals is to, is to differentiate cells not only by their spike width and spiking statistics, bursty and non-bursty cells, but also by their layer 
and then also to use optogenetic approaches as we can target subtypes of cells as a label so we can turn the cell on. So really the big picture is to try and identify every different type of cell by layer, control its activity, and then play the symphony and see what you know, really affects the monkey's ability to, to correctly identify a stimulus or select it from among distractors. But yeah, the, the lambda organization of this is a big uh, open area of research. Yes. Um, it, back in your, in your slide where you show the increased firing of putative um, fast spiking cells during um, during attention, yeah. was that invariant of, um, of location based for, for each given um, fast spiking cell? So, so uh, we tend to record from a, a, a relatively restricted region in each monkey, so we place the chamber unilaterally and it corresponds to a position that covers a region of the lower... Oh, no, 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 sorry, not, not brain location, but, um, but receptive. Field. So wherever wherever the target is, oh, I see. Uh, moves yeah. Back. So those exams, those cells were were all cells where the stimulus was placed within the classical receptive field, mm -hmm. and those show attention dependent increases in firing rate. For the pyramidal cells, we also placed the stimulus in the center uh, of the receptive field, and there yeah. we saw both increases and decreases. Yeah. So we think that those decreases of the putative pyramidal cells are due to the activation of inhibitory interneurons, including the narrow spike. Yeah. And in fact, mouse work recently from Massimo Scanziani's lab has shown us that activation of parvalvian cells leads to downregulation of gain. Mm -hmm. So they really so are a, those a, a high-pass filter sort of thing. Uh, high-pass filter, I'm not sure I know. In terms of um, firing rate, that only those cells with enough activation to overcome that inhibition will. Oh, I see. So in other words, you're saying, why don't they get suppressed like the pyramidal cells do? No, 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 no. no. I mean, the circuitry has to be completely different for uh -huh. okay. those. Yeah, so, so I think the way that we view this is that attention is its direct effect is to excite both inhibitory and excitatory inputs. Let's say FEF feedback activates both of them. But those inhibitory cells are particularly effective at suppressing the activity of parental cells. And the, the goal really is to, the, the purpose, the function of these cells, or an important function of these cells is to, is to maintain the dynamic range of the system. And so they are positioned to inhibit the cells that receive the excitatory feedback and, and keep things from, from, uh, from going to saturation or being suppressed and being uninformed. Is that? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's, that's, we can talk more yeah, about yeah, that if you want more detail. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.